quite a bit of stuff there. Most of it I want you to follow up between now and maybe tomorrow because it'll answer some of the questions that I've had emails about in terms of structuring about, in terms of critical analysis for sections three and four. So we'll have a look at what we actually do as we review our various sources and what we're going to do with them in order to try and come up with a compare and contrast. Different perspectives which help us to make the article more interesting, but is also developing your skills which we call critical thinking and critical analysis, which is the major target of higher education. It's the thing that makes the B in bachelor's, bachelor of Science really important. It's the thing that makes the M in Master of Science or Master of Arts important. As I was saying up in York a couple of weeks ago, <coughs> when a group of, I was talking to a group of um, test scientists, test engineers, people who do software testing as a profession, were saying, ah, we need a BSc in software testing. And I was saying, actually, probably not. You need to do it as part of data science because there's so many different, oh, uh, computer science, because you need to understand coding as well as how to test. And I said, the most important thing, actually, about all of the undergraduate degrees we offer here at the University of Derby or across the world is the B, the bachelor. It should be in huge text that high. And then the SC or the A for science or art, a bit smaller, because it kind of gives a bit of focus the type of understanding you've got. And then the title, computer science, IT, nets and computer uh, security, uh, forensic, is almost irrelevant. Because what you will learn in terms of the actual facts and techniques and so on will change tomorrow. They'll certainly change by the time you go out from here. And so it's the bachelor's part that is crucial. Understanding how you research, how you find those interesting ideas that allow you to begin to understand how the world works. Because that's really what it's all about. A BSc is about understanding how part of the world works. Whether it's in computer science or games, uh, CGP or CFI or whatever, is almost, but not quite, but almost irrelevant. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is looking at how do we evaluate all those sources that you've been researching now for the last three, four weeks that help you to build that article <clears throat> about one of the various t topics or the connection between one or two of those topics, which is kind of interesting. And quite a few of you are beginning now to firm up your article topic with a combination between two of the top big topic areas. And that's really going to end up with a much better quality of article. <clears throat> so we want to understand the purpose and approach of reviewing academic sources and literature and then what we do with that information. Now all of these sources that you are researching for do a range of things. First of all, at the moment you're finding a context and then you're finding out more about it. And it provides you with, if you find the right source of sources as well as the stories about what's happening, but you also look for some of the academic stuff, it will give you a framework, it will help you to understand what the structure of that article is going to be about. Literature researches also help you to understand the connection between what we already know and the things we don't know. If you go back to what uh, Rumsfeld said in, uh, many years ago in one of the Gulf Wars, it helps to identify the things that we do know, the known knowns, also the things that we know that we don't know, the known unknowns, 
But if we do the research well and start thinking very carefully about what we are finding, it may help us to be able to identify the things that we didn't know, that we didn't know, or as he put it, the unknown unknowns. Because the unknown unknowns are the things that come and bite us real badly if we don't find them out. And in the context that Rumsfeld was talking about, if you don't know that you don't know a whole lot of things about your enemy, you might be planning your offensive on the wrong assumptions, on the wrong basis, and you might get defeated. <coughs> or, in terms of the academic career, the academic life, the thing that you're concentrating at the moment on for the next three years, one of the things that we really want to find out are the things we didn't know we didn't know. And an awful lot of businesses are quite blind about an awful lot of aspects of all of our technologies that we're studying across all the programs represented here. A few years ago, I used to set a second year module assignment for, and a third year module assignment for the IT students to try and identify things in the governance field, the security and um, how to look after information appropriately and correctly. Try to identify the things that small businesses didn't know that they didn't know. Because here is the answer, folks, to you guys out there. And that's one of the reasons why we put several, quite a few of their best assignments up online, so that they can actually find the answer. The final point from a studying perspective and learning to research and writing academically is that it provides evidence of the fact that you have actually learned how to do good research. That's why I want only in your bibliography a list of those sources that you have actually cited. Cited in terms of here is the evidence, this is where I got this fact from, here is where I got this context from, here is where I got this idea and concept from. To prove that you are capable of researching effectively. Once you've got a body of sources, here is a little sort of bubble di diagram of some of the things that you need to be doing while you are <coughs> looking at those sources to understand their credibility. Are they something we can rely upon? Who said it? What are the key sources? Well, there are various ways of doing that. One of the simplest ones is the most <coughs> authoritative ones are ones you will find through the academic journals. The online journals through ACM Digital, uh, the IEEE Proceedings, through organisations like Springer, uh, IGI and other publishers of textbooks. And Wiley is another very good one, but with a bit more of a, a business emphasis on the implications. You're wanting to find out what are the big questions, the big issues. What is it that the world is worrying about? And so in the context of your articles, that's why I say go and look at some of the professional sources online. Because what you're looking for through uh, companies like Tech Republic, and the others of that sort of nature, ZDNA, is these are the big questions that are keeping senior managers on the IT field, the computer science field, awake at night. These are the things that they want solutions to. And then through that, those sources, you can begin to find out what various authoritative sources are saying about them. And if you're looking at LinkedIn and you're looking at the sort of field of big data analytics, or you're looking at social media analytics, you'll see a range of different perspectives. From the rather sales and marketing approach which says, oh it's fantastic and if you do it right, then you can improve your profitability uh, by 5 or 10%, you can improve your turnover and, and so on by that sort of amount. 
you can get more insights, you can increase your customer base. And then you'll find others from a different perspective who say, yeah, well, not necessarily the case. Why is it that <coughs> only 5 or 10% of organizations are actually successful in doing these things? Or if you're in the security field, that's in security, guys. Why is it that although we've been publishing data about how to do security, about all of the guidelines as to how to do it effectively, the annual reports which are produced by PricewaterhouseCoopers every year show that the number of organizations who are doing this effectively has kind of plateaued at around about 40, 45, 50%. What's happened to the other 50%? Why aren't they learning? Or something came up today looking at LinkedIn and one of the feeds there. Someone was posted a long post linking to an article in the Telegraph saying, oh, one of the problems with IT these days in businesses is that the IT organization is a big blocker. They won't let me do things. And I can see out there, as a lowly user of IT, and user computing, I can do this easily with uh, Salesforce.com or Office 365 or whatever, and I can actually make the contract myself ever so easily. We went through that argument in the 1980s, and I was involved in that as part of the sort of management team at uh, Rolls-Royce Aerospace as we were managing end-user computing and finding out that it kind of works and it kind of doesn't. People who thought they knew how to use DB, uh, a database product, Access uh, as an example, or spreadsheets, Excel, they can put together a nice little office system that would do the work for my immediate uh, group around me. And I can do that in a couple of weeks. And if I went to IT, they would tell me either, no, you can't have it, or B, if we do it properly, it's going to cost you 100,000 quid, and it'll take two years to do it, to fit it into the... And you think, hang on. And we went through that. Lots of people created their own little systems, and then the guy who created it, she moved on, or he moved on. Who's going to support it? Or someone did an Excel spreadsheet, a nice big complicated one with 10 layers or tabs and interconnections with six other as complicated Excel spreadsheets. And they left. And it's, uh, how do we support it? But have any of you ever created a slightly complicated spreadsheet to say 100 columns wide, 50 columns deep, plus three or four tabs doing things with that data. How many of you have done a spreadsheet like that? And then someone says to you, oh, I'd like it modified slightly. And you wrote that six months ago. Have you any clue what you did in that spreadsheet? It's quicker to reinvent it, actually. And so at that stage, we kind of closed it down over the years and went for much more centralised provision of services. <coughs> now, 30, 35 years on, the debate is happening again. And amusingly, I remember in the middle of that period, a very, very large organisation that I know of were, went in exactly a different direction. They had had this devolved approach to IT. And they said, oh, this is terrible. We are a company which has a serious organization to produce computer services, and we're going to centralize everything. And 18 months later, when it all locked up solidly, they went to a slightly more distributed environment again. So there are lots of debates. And here we are, 2017, re-debating what we did in 1987. The world, the wheel of history goes round. And so you need to start looking for those cycles of fads. Where people are so fed up with that extreme, the pendulum is over there, it's too difficult, and the pendulum goes woof to this one, the opposite extreme, and suddenly everybody discovers that's too difficult as well. So there are different debates, different perspectives, different positions. And what your academic response uh, re research is to do is to find somewhere in the middle 
and justify why that and that position is wrong using what we call critical thinking, critical comparison, comparing and contrasting, connecting to evidence of what was wrong and what went well over there, and what was wrong and what was went well, went well over there, and trying to find that middle balance point, which will be different for every single organisation. Lots of big issues, lots of different perspectives, and that's what you should be finding out as you do your academic research. In order to do that, you drop to the green one at the bottom. Where did these ideas come from in the first place? How did end-user computing start? What drove it? Was it access to PCs? Was it access to clever languages like SAS that allowed you to manipulate data incredibly easily? Was it Excel, uh, access, and all the other sort of <coughs> systems that made life easy on the PC, perhaps? In many of the areas that you're working on, you need to look at the fundamental definitions. Just go into Google and type define and then the phrase, and you'll get lots of definitions which will help you to understand where these ideas came from, when they were invented. Because one of the most important lessons I ever learned is that you need, if you're having a discussion, whether you're writing an article, whether you're writing an academic paper, you need to get the definitions locked down. There's a meeting I went to back in the mid 80s, a bit, bit later, maybe the late 80s, with my boss. We were both quite experienced at Rolls Royce. We just happened to have grown up and learnt up the business in two different parts of the organisation. <coughs> and he wanted me to do some data analysis for him. And for something like 15, 20 minutes, the, the discussion got nowhere. And suddenly I realised what the problem was. It was just two words. And we were using those two words in a Rolls Royce context to mean two totally different things. Once I'd identified that, or we'd identified that, settled on the common definition, which was my boss's definition. It wouldn't have mattered whether they settled on his definition or my definition, but, it, but either way, the meeting was over in five minutes. Because we knew exactly what we were talking about now, and then we could move on. So think about <coughs> definitions. They are absolutely fundamental. And so if you do that define blah, and you get four different versions of the definition of blah, it's acceptable if you've got enough space, not in this article because there isn't enough space, but in most uh, assignments, you will have space to then identify or quote, uh, copy, paste and cite two or three of the really interesting definitions which show the polarities, the spread of the topic area. Then you go move on and justify why you are either creating a new definition or you are taking one of those definitions as the definition you are going to use in your assignment or the article. So definitions are absolutely vital, but you've got to justify the definition you are using. Justify means explaining why it is appropriate to use that definition in this current context. Because you might want to use a different definition in another context. Now we move over to the right hand side, which is all about the sort of the topic, the domain as we call it, the area of knowledge. <coughs> this applies just as much to your article. What are the key things we already know? The way of thinking about the topic. So if you're looking, say, at the AI, machine learning, cognitive computing, sort of part of the question, you need, first of all, to think about the definitions, and then, what do we really know about these three different sets of technology, which are about how machines, computers, can mimic, in some respect, what humans do to be intelligent. 
And there are fundamental differences which you might want to pull out from your academic research about what the difference between hard and soft AI is, what machine learning is all about, and the difference also of this field called cognitive computing. The thing that underpins many new types of systems like the IBM Watson environment that I'll be hearing about next week. At an undergraduate level, a first year level, the next line down, the bluish one, is getting pretty complicated. But it's to do with meaning. What are the meanings of the words that build into what we're talking about? And how they connect to different terms. More importantly, what are the structures that lead us to understand our field that we're uh, working in? And whilst we look across at the top blue one, issues and debates, we also drop down to the right-hand pink one. Sorry, what right-hand green one. Of all the questions that we've identified, which ones have already been solved? Because it's really rather more interesting to look at the ones which haven't been solved. Now, the interesting thing, I think, from your perspective is, if you are able to compare and contrast and then connect ideas together which don't immediately have a connection, you will come up with some very, very interesting ideas for questions which haven't yet been solved. You might also be able to create ideas which are solutions which no one has come across. Those are what I and my colleagues are looking for in your work over the next three years. Because you are all unique, and I keep mentioning, with different backgrounds, different experience, different ways of seeing things and understanding things, you can actually create connections that are really absolutely stunning. And that's what we're looking for. And that's why I don't like the idea of uh, AI-type systems marking your assignments. <coughs> Because if I feed in a dozen really good ones that answer the question on the basis of existing knowledge, some of the most interesting idea, uh, assignments which connect that together with that, and let me give you an example. One of my colleagues, who's now moved on to another university, worked in the field of Spanish literature, specifically South American Spanish literature. And there was a poem that she was wanting to understand how it worked and why it worked. And it had defied almost all analysis for quite a long time. And she had this wild idea, because she kind of looked at other things out over there and out over there, she suddenly came up with an understanding that a really deep item of physics knowledge Theory, string theory might be able to help us. So she went through the step-by-step -step process of applying a bit, little bit of string theory to the um, poem and suddenly got an amazing insight to what was really going on. So that was, you know, who would have ever thought of connecting some of the most abstract and abstruse theories of advanced th physics to understanding Spanish literature. Would any of us? Probably not. And it's that sort of wild connectivity that makes us some very, very interesting advances in human knowledge. And that's what we're trying to get you to look at when you think about that green <coughs> um, box there. So your literature research helps you to come up with clearer and more focused articles. Connect to the rubric that tells you what I'm looking for or what my colleagues are looking for in the other modules you are doing. And focus in on answering the question. <coughs> your literature review, your literature research will then help you to improve your research approach, the methodology, just an approach to doing things. 
it will help you to understand how to use search engines more effectively, how to use your search terms more effectively, how to refine them to get narrower and narrower feeds of information that actually are going to be useful. Even if you've got lots and lots of sources which don't really help you with this particular assignment, by doing all of this reading and researching, you're going to broaden your overall understanding <coughs> of your field, and hopefully many other fields so kind of around the edges. And as you work through the knowledge that you've gained, <coughs> you understand the context better and better. You understand how you're going to get from the topic that you've chosen, the topic that is actually in your expanded title or subtitle, and leads you through to those conclusions at the bottom end of that gold arrow that I showed you a few weeks ago. However, <coughs> Sometimes you get into this position, how do I start? And that's one of the things I've been helping many of you with over the last three weeks or so. It's difficult to do literature research effectively if you don't understand what the problem is, or without understanding what the research uh, topic is. So you have to do some exploratory, just reading around the topic, maybe use Wikipedia to get some ideas. But remember, Wikipedia is there to give you a few ideas and follow all of those links, the references, particularly into the more authoritative sources or the more business-like sources. Once you've got that broader picture, and by now almost all of you have got there, I've no I noticed last week, which was encouraging, there's still one or two who are kind of a bit fuzzy. But once you've got an idea of your topic, then it becomes so much easier to find those search terms that you can put into your search engines. And so the literature review, literature research, then helps you to narrow down the topic. And I'm sure many of you are discovering that already. Now that you're getting lots more sources, now it becomes much clearer what the real topic is going to be for your article. And as that re cited reference there uh, from Kumar 2005, which is a book about research, the literature review, the literature research, <coughs> helps you to understand the relationship between the topic you're trying to research, the subject of the article, and all of that research you're doing. And you, as I said before, you're liable to end up with two, three, four times as many sources that you collect into your working <coughs> bibliography than you're actually going to cite, partly because a whole lot of them are not directly relevant, which is why you're not citing them. But each one of those sources is still valuable to you as a student because they tell you things that might be useful to you next week, next month, next module. <coughs> so that's why I say use, as you do all of your research in all of your modules, build those working bibliographies because they will help you over your future career here to be able to come back to, oh, I know I had that item about, is rather interesting, and you can go straight to it. Rather than having to try and re-Google it, and you probably won't find <coughs> it again. As Nicholas Carr said in his book, The Shallows, subtitled, How the Internet is Changing the Way We Think, he points out that an awful lot of people these days don't bother to remember anything because they know they can, or they feel, that they can Google it again and get the same sources. Has anybody tried finding a source or a, an article, an item of information, two or three weeks after you first found it and found it's incredibly difficult to find that same item again? Uh, yep. 
it's not as easy as we like to think, which is why we need to develop our memory to remember these things. Have our working bibliography and our PDF prints of all of those sources so we can actually have it there. We haven't lost it. <coughs> Because if we've lost it, we haven't got the citation, the reference, we can't use that idea. Because we have no evidence to cite. <clears throat> In terms of previous work, what happened before, the way that Nets and Security was working, say, five years ago, what are the developments, what's the research, now, we need to find out what people have actually done, what people have actually said. If we don't know history, we are condemned to repeat history. This is quite regularly quoted these days. If we don't know what we were doing with end-user computing, and the issues about end-user computing in 1985, 86, 87, well, we've already done it. In, 19, in 2000, 15, 16, 17, uh, and so on, we're doing the same, making the same mistakes as we did back in the 1980s. Because we've forgotten. We need to know how the research was done, we need to know how things were done. We need to understand what the consequences <coughs> were. What were the really great things we got out of end-user computing in the 1980s that we can replicate today in the late 2010s? Because there are some things we can do. And as we open up in the big field of big data analytics, there is a place for the end-user to do some of the analytics. We don't need to have all of the retrievals pre-specified by some <coughs> experts over there. But there are challenges in allowing everybody to do these things. Because they may not have the background, the training, the awareness, even the natural ability to do the job properly and people will make mistakes. So we have to think about the consequences of the way things were done in the past. And if we're looking at the AI, machine learning, cognitive sciences topic area, <clears throat> there are a lot of areas that we can look back over recent and long ago history to find out what does work, what doesn't work, what we should be doing, and what we shouldn't be doing. So finding out what has been done previously is always going to be important because what we do as we're in research is build on the past and try and stand on the shoulders of giants, as someone once said. So for you to do over the next week, to help you to understand what you're supposed to be doing with all of this information you've got, <coughs> In thinking about it, first of all, find three sources out there somewhere, maybe starting off with the University of Derby skills uh, section in the library skills area, researching literature. Add those to your working bibliography, because it's going to be kind of useful to remind you in the future. And while you're work moving between lectures and seminars and workshops and so on, Discuss with each other what you've actually learned. Because you won't all have the same three sources. If you do, you won't pick up the same messages from each of those sources. Right, there's a trivial example. If I took all of you down to the Mark Eaton roundabout, all 140, 50 of you, lined you up all the way around, and then staged a couple of, in, of big accidents and then had you talking to the police as they came to find out what was going on, there's a, say there's 150 of you here, there will be 150 different stories about what actually happened. 150 different stories to who was to blame. 150 uh, reports and stories of what actually happened. We see things, we hear things, we understand things differently. So discussion even if you are using the same three sources, is going to be valuable because you each bring a different insight to the discussion. And that means 
if there's say three or four of you talking about something together, you'll build together with several different perspectives. You will then be able to judge between those perspectives and make your own decisions as to why you believe this is going to be for you the best way to do your research. In broadening your knowledge, read, read, read. You came here to read a BSc in computer science, CGP, IT, etc., etc. The clue is in the, in the term. You came here to read your subject. <coughs> so don't do what I, I heard from a colleague when I first started here in the East Tower lift. The little lift which you can't get into nowadays, a bit like the one in the North Tower. And in it, there was this little lady who was utterly steamingly angry. I have never seen a person so cross. It appears she had apparently just been in a seminar, and the week before, she had set this group of third year students, final year students, a passage to read for the seminar. It was a literature type seminar. Uh, seminar. And during the seminar, she noticed that one person over there didn't seem to have a clue what the article was about. So she asked this girl, did you read the passage? No, came the, the blunt answer. Oh, why didn't you read it? The answer came back bold as brass. I didn't come to university to read books. <laughs> and I have never seen, as I say, anyone so, so angry in my life. The message, you are here to read. Now, reading is reading, but it can also mean you're listening. Because, you know, we've got so much more in YouTube, we've got so much more audio stuff, videos. As long as you're looking at or listening to reasonably authoritative sources, I don't really mind. I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire and say you've got to read words on paper pages or words on the screen. The important point is, keep the news feeds, keep the information flowing in. Subscribe to as many different <coughs> professional and other sources of information that it keeps coming in. So that you are aware of what is happening. How many of you are connected to LinkedIn now? Could I suggest that it would be quite valuable for all of you, now that you've cleaned up your Facebook profile so it doesn't contain all sorts of interesting pictures of how you were lying on the gut in the gutter on a Friday night blasted out of your mind, now you've done that, start thinking about the value of creating your own professional version on LinkedIn. Connect to a whole range of the various news feeds and you'll find those through Pulse and elsewhere. And if you look at other people, uh, say you connect to me and look at what I'm, who I'm following or what I'm following, you'll see at the bottom <coughs> of the, the profile a whole lot of news feed. Pulse, uh, big data, um, technology and so on. And those are where you will get a lot of very interesting feeds about what's happening today. That's where I found this item about end user computing, the cycle of history. Someone had found that article in the, ta in the Telegraph and said, hey, here's an interesting debate. These are things we ought to be thinking about. So read widely. Find out what other researchers have done. Find out what is actually happening. Find out what chief information officers, chief security officers, <coughs> chief marketing officers, chief strategic officers, all of these sorts of people at the top, end, top of businesses. <coughs> Find out what they're doing. If you're doing CGP, find out what's going on in the games programming field. Find out where the other career opportunities are, because not all of your career opportunities are in programming clever games. 
Some of the techniques you're using there can be used in education for gamification. Some of the techniques can be used in financial services. Some of the techniques can be used in intelligence analysis. There's all sorts of things you can learn about your chosen career direction by following what's happening. See what the theories are, the frameworks. These are all the valuable questions that you need to be thinking about. Theories sometimes claim to be the answer. <coughs> but you can also turn theories around to a very valuable source of questions about how the world really works and does it always work like that? How many did maths at, university, at school and looked at the formula for gravity? Remember the f formula for gravity? M1 times M2 over G times something is a force that holds two things together. Which in theory is the answer to how quickly things will move towards, or towards each other. And if we're talking about us, is how quickly we fall to the floor. But we know that most things don't fall to the floor according to the law of gravity, particularly the lighter, fluffy things. They just sort of drift down. So you can use it. It doesn't behave like that. Therefore, there's some questions. Why? What is it that stops a feather falling in an atmosphere at the same rate, accelerating at the same rate as a dead ball? So theories and frameworks are sources of, are very valuable sources of questions that help you to understand what's happening at a particular point in time, in a particular context. Literature tells you those gaps, where we don't understand why something happened. <coughs> why is it that machine learning doesn't always work? What aspects of machine, machine learning <coughs> does work? What areas of cognitive computing does work and doesn't work? So, second little task for you to think about over the next week. There are lots and lots of sources out there, mainly university uh, websites, starting obviously with the University of Derby website, to find out how to do how the review of your literature sources. How to work out how credible they are, how to work out what the key concepts are that they each embody, and the differences between those different so, uh, sources. <coughs> Where have we got to today? Where are we with machine learning? Where are we with social media and its effect on us? What different parts of the fields of knowledge, psychology, sociology, business, and many other areas, relate to the question of the use of uh, the rise of social media and its impact on how we work, how we do things. You need to think also about the question of where are the best sources going to be. <coughs> That's what I've been trying to focus on to some extent in the workshops. Should you be just going to the ACM Digital, IEEE, and all of the various international journals of this, that, and the other that you can get through Athens? Or do you need to go elsewhere? And that's part of what that last point is about. Because depending on the context, depending on your objectives, it may be that some of the academic stuff isn't relevant enough. Hence, going to the stuff that keeps senior management awake at night and critical evaluation. This is a plea from one or two people. How do we do <coughs> sections three and four of the guidance? What it means is, first of all, you are not describing things. Not saying, this is what <coughs> is. This is what so-and-so said. This is what so-and-so -so else said. That's just pure description. It's ever so simple to do. It's what you did at school, by and large. And it's almost capable of copying and pasting from your various sources. Pure description.
critical analysis and critical evaluation is thinking about comparing strengths and weaknesses of different concepts and ideas. It's about thinking of consequences. Well, if this is the case from this source cited, then that must mean that, blah, blah, blah. And so critical evaluation is comparing, contrasting, and then identifying consequences. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for business? What does it mean for the way society is organized? <coughs> what does it mean for the intelligence uh, community? What does it mean for lots of different things? And having got to that consequence, please don't stop there, because there's probably another consequence that flows on from that. Try to identify that. Because often people only go to the first level consequence. And anything else is considered to be, well, I couldn't foresee that. Unintended consequence. And there are a lot of people who like, who like making decisions without going to second and third order consequences. And then say, oh, it all got that wrong. Unforeseen uh, circumstances. Unforeseen consequences. Rubbish. Most of them can be seen. And if you go back to one of the greatest problems we've seen in recent history with the credit crunch, the collapse of the subprime mortgage market in 2007 and 8, lots and lots of people would say, oh, that was an unforeseen consequence. Rubbish. There were people who were writing about it who were positioning themselves for four and five and six years before that who were saying, it's going to happen. And some of the guys made staggering fortunes, 20 billion, because they could see what was going wrong. So don't tell me about unforeseen consequences. Almost all of them are foreseeable. There are a few which aren't, and they're truly not foreseeable, but most of them are. <coughs> and as you get better, at critical evaluation. As you get better at thinking through the logic of your sources, your arguments, you will be able to identify more and more of those things which the easy solution is, I can't be bothered, it'll be an un unintended consequence, unforeseeable consequence, out of my hands. <coughs> it's somebody else's problem. Critical evaluation, which you can start doing now because it's not that difficult, will help you get past that. It will help you to produce much better assignments. It will help you to get much, much better grades. And that surely must be something you're working for. <coughs> So that first ten lines of the context of your article is to set the big picture in which your context exists. It gives you the opportunity, because you only have ten lines, it's not a lot, but you can do it. Here's the context, here's the problem, and this is why I want to write about it. Because it's fun, because it's interesting, because it has significant consequences. <coughs> Little task here, another one, writing that literature review, writing that analysis. Follow this, do it overnight. How valid, how important, how reliable are your sources? This particularly comes into assessing sources like the Wikipedias and so on, and blogs. How would you know that that blog is actually valid to use? How do you know that that particular perspective is worth using? <laughs> is the blogger someone who used to work at a very senior level in a big organisation that we all know about? Or is it someone who's just had a brainstorm and turns out to be a second year undergraduate who has an axe to grind? What are their credentials? Who has reviewed the validity of the papers? So this is one of the nice things about academic journal articles. <coughs> they will all have been peer-reviewed by a minimum, normally, of three, 
and often up to four or five experts in the field who say, yeah, it kind of fits in, <coughs> it's well argued, the logic is clear, the research that's reported is valid, yeah, we've, some of them will have checked the formulae, will have checked the calculations, most likely. So find some sources on how you assess the validity of those sources that you have found. So you can learn to be certain about all those sources you're building into all of your uh, assessments. Not necessarily so critically important in this particular article, but still worthwhile developing your ideas and your techniques and your approach to the validity of your sources now. Get, it, get started on it and so that you have a more authoritative article. Now, at the end of it all, what we are looking for, and this is why I say I don't want cut and paste, I don't want the he says, she says form of citing referencing, which goes along the lines of self, brackets, 2010, suggests that. Whereas, um, Voorhis, 2013, contradicts that and says this. I don't want to hear that. I want your voice. I want to hear the story written in your words. And then you, so you would write it. Richard, uh, sorry, you would say something along the lines of machine learning is based on very clever algorithms that do X, Y, and Z. Brackets itself, 2011. A refinement of that approach leads to this form of more effective machine learning, brackets, for his 2014. That <coughs> second approach, where the name and the date is in brackets, is written with your voice. Now, some of you for whom English is a second or third language might be worried about that, because you will be worried that it might be difficult for me to understand your English. Let's put it this way. I prefer to see your English, even if it isn't yet high-grade academic English, because then I know that it is your own way of thinking <coughs> and analyzing and writing. Because we are using all of these assignments, all of the assessments, for the next three years as a way kind of a window into your brain to find out how you think, how you apply knowledge, how you make judgments. So we don't want to see your ability to cut and paste. We don't want to see your ability to just string self 2007 says this, Borges 2014 says that. That doesn't tell me much about what you're doing. It's your justified perspective based on a logical analysis of all of the evidence that you have collected and want to use in that piece of work. You're pulling it together and coming up with interesting ideas. That's what the synthesis means. You're putting things together. A little bibliography of sources that might be of value. Thank you very much, folks. I'll see you all tomorrow. No exceptions. And hopefully a few more people will be there as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>